Don't worry about it. <laughs> I will just, hopefully I have my, my sermon in my heart, and I won't have to look at this, this computer screen. So we're, we're entering in uh, to a three-week uh, series called Be the Church. And several years ago, I was watching this movie called Gladiator. And Gladiator has a famous scene in it. It's Russell Crowe, and he plays this famous military leader who gets betrayed. And it's an incredible movie. And, and there's this time where, where he is talking to the leader of, of all of Rome. And they're talking about this idea of what Rome was supposed to be. That Rome was an ideal. It was an ID, an ID, uh, an I, excuse me. It was an ideal and an, uh, help me, ID. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I can't say that. Idea, thank you. Not Ikea. All right, man, I have not been drinking this morning. I've never had that happen. Tongue twisted. So in, in this movie, he's talking about this ideal that Rome was supposed to be, but that it had become corrupted. And many times when, when you think about the church, God has this incredible vision and passion for what the church is supposed to be and what it's called to be. God has this high view of what the church is. But unfortunately, in our culture today, the church has become really, by many considerations, unnecessary. The church is considered lame. The church is considered just unimportant in our culture today. So there was a book that came out a few years ago. It was written by a pastor named Kevin DeYoung. And Kevin, in this book, and Ted Kluck were the, the two authors, the name of the book was Why We Love the Church. Because unfortunately, truly, in our culture today, Two different things are happening. One, there's a group of people who are saying, hey, the church is absolutely unnecessary for my spirituality. That I can actually find God better on a golf course with my buddy, eating a tuna fish sandwich, talking about Jesus, than I can in the church. The other side is that the church is not relevant. The church is not important. The church is not necessary. The other side is the church is actually bad. The church is, is corrupt. The church, like, it, we should be doing everything we can to, to get out of and stay away from the church. But yet that's not the picture that God paints in his word in the New Testament about what the church is called to do and be. It's funny, I have a 15-year-old daughter, and uh, her name is Mia. And Mia is very much like a lot of teenagers. And when Mia is, is ambivalent towards something, so if I say to Mia, Mia, how was that movie you went to? Invariably, she'll go, eh, eh. Hey, how was that party? Eh. Uh, hey, how was, when I pick her up from school? Hey, how was your day at school? Eh, eh. And it always has to come with some sort of shoulder movement and kind of a scrunched face. It's an eh. And a lot of times, when you, when you talk about the church today, even among Christians, that's kind of the response that you get. 
The church. Eh. Eh. Meh. It's not, no, you know. It's not really, not really that necessary. It's not really that important. But again, God has this elevated view. Jesus loved the church and died for her. And he has a great plan for her. And endorsing the book, Why We Love the Church, Mark Galley, the senior managing editor from Christianity Today, had this to say. If Jesus thought the church was worth dying for, it may be just worth living in. While not ignoring the sins of the church, DeYoung and Cluck remind us why the church remains the most authentic place to encounter and live out the good news of Jesus Christ. So here's what we're hoping to accomplish in this series, what we're going for. We're hoping as we work our way through Scripture that God would enlarge our vision for the power and the purpose of the local church personally corporately, and into the world. So my task today is to kind of set the stage for, for what the church is, why it matters, because guess what? The church isn't just what happens here between 10 and 11.15 on Sunday morning. This is one expression of the church. It's not the full expression of the church. This is just one expression, but it's an important expression of the church. So we're hoping that we're going to see the relevance for our own personal lives and our personal growth and our callings and for those who aren't here yet. That we would see the high value that God places on community and relationships. And lastly, we would see the importance that the church plays in serving the world. In the end, we hope that every single one of us will, will be more passionate about the local church and more committed to serving it. In short, the church matters. It matters. Several months ago, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine, and uh, we were talking about family and kids and work and all that, and I, I asked him a question. I said, hey, have you and your family, have you found a church to be planted in? And his response to me was very much like what I said earlier. He said, no, not really. He said, I serve the bigger body of Christ. Like, I serve the big C. I don't really need to be in any kind of local church. And I said, you know, and he, so he said to me, you know, because like, I know you believe me, right? Like, I don't actually have to go to church to be a Christian, and I said to him, I said, man, you, you are exactly right. You don't have to be, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. You don't. You don't. Because becoming a Christian is, is as simple as believing by grace through faith what Jesus did on the cross for you. We studied it a few series ago in Ephesians 2 where Paul says that you are saved by grace through faith alone. It's not of works that no one can boast. We, we do not earn salvation by our works. We don't keep salvation by our works. We ultimately aren't justified by our works. We're justified by his work. What Jesus did on the cross. So I said to him, you're exactly right. 
you do not need to go to church to be a Christian. I said, but you don't need to go home to be a husband. You don't have, you don't have to go home to be a husband. It just kind of helps the relationship. <laughs> you don't have to show up to practice to be a basketball player. You don't have to show up to the events to be in the, be a musician. You don't have to. Hey, man, I'm out there. I'm hooping at Lifetime Fitness by myself, man. I'm like, man, look at me, dude. I'm LeBron. I'm KD, right? Like, dude, you ever going to play on a team? Nah, man. I don't need a team. I, man, look at me. I'm balling, dude. Look at me. I'm playing. Yeah, but like, dude, like, you can't ultimately become everything you're called to be by yourself. You need a team and other people around you. So, so I'm just going to do a little foundation on the church, and then I'm just going to talk about six reasons why the church should matter personally to us. So here's a little bit of background. So in Matthew 16, 18, it's a famous passage of scripture where Jesus is talking about the church. And Jesus said this, he said, blessed are you, Simon, who was Peter, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood. This, this understanding of who Jesus was. Jesus was asking Peter, Peter, who do people say that I am? Peter's like, hey, some say you're Elijah, some say you're John the Baptist. He says, who do you say I am? He says, you're the Christ. You're the, the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. And now Jesus says, hey, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. My father in heaven revealed it. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell or Hades will not overcome it. So the first thing I want you to, to get your hands around is this simple concept that the church is not a man-made institution. The church was God's idea. Because so many in our culture today think that the church, they'll say, oh man, the church is just, just a man-made institution. It's an institution to kind of indoctrinate. It's an institution to control. It's an institution created by man uh, for the purpose of trying to find some transcendence. Da, 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 da. No, the church was God's idea. It's God's idea. The second thing I want you to understand is that the church has multiple expressions. Because there is this thing in Scripture, when it talks about the big C church, the big C church is the fact that the church is every believer from all times, everywhere, who have believed in Jesus. It's called the universal church, the invisible church. When you become a follower of Jesus, you are baptized into the body of Christ and you become a part of the body of Christ, the church. So there is the universal, but then there is the church, what's called particular or the church local. There's the visible and invisible, the local and the universal. You cannot read the New Testament and not see that, that, that everywhere Paul was going, he was planting local churches. Local churches with established leadership of where people were, were interconnected and interdependent. So when he writes in the New Testament, he's writing to the church at Coloss, the church at 
Philippi, the church at Corinth, right? He's writing to these local churches. There's nowhere in the New Testament where you can say, I'm exclusively called to only be a part of the universal church. The church invisible. Every single believer is called to be planted in a local church. Let me read this from Wayne Mack. Scripture speaks very clearly to the fact that identification with God's people in a formal public way was considered normative and essential in New Testament times. A careful study of the New Testament doesn't reveal even a hint of any believer who was truly saved but not part of a local church. You can't read the New Testament and find it. That God's desire was that every single person would know and be known. Know and be known. Scripture also gives us three other descriptions or imagery to illustrate the church. It says in Scripture that the church is a body. We are all interconnected with Christ and with one another. A body cut off from the head doesn't function well. A body part cut off from the rest of the body doesn't function well. So he says the church is a, is a body. The church is also called the bride of Christ. The bride. As I said, Jesus loved the church. He gave himself up for her, Ephesians 5 says. And he makes her beautiful. The church submits to Jesus, grows in beauty before him, and follows him. The two are one, now in preview, and later in fullness. So people that say, I have Jesus, but I don't care about the church, is like somebody coming to your house and say, Dave, I like you, but I can't stand your wife. Let's hang out, bro. Ah, oh, man. My wife and I are kind of one, dude. If you're going to diss my wife, like, dude, you ain't sitting down watching the NBA Finals eating my pizza. Come on. They are inseparable as husband and wife. It says it's a body, it's a bride. And it's a building. According to 1 Corinthians 3, the church is God's building with Jesus as the foundation. Very rarely will someone build a basement without the rest of the house and say, dude, look at my basement. Isn't this beautiful? It's like, yeah, dude, your basement's beautiful. It's really necessary. But like, come on, you, you need the rest of the house. No one except Christians who want Jesus, but not the church. They're connected. So when you serve the church, you're serving Jesus. Because they're interconnected. So you might be sitting there going, hey man, that's great information, Pastor Dave. Good job. But I'm still not convinced. That's great that you're talking about the church and all this stuff. But where, what about me personally? Where I'm at? Here's six reasons biblically why the church should matter to you personally. Number one, we all need encouragement. We all need encouragement. And the church is supposed to be a place where we can 
we can find encouragement among one another. When I was 26 years old, my MBA dream came crashing to a halt. I'd always thought in my mind, hey man, I'm going to play 10 years. I'm going to get out. I'm going to go be a, uh, get into broadcasting, live a great life, live on a golf course, have a gazebo out there, eat strawberries and cream every morning, go play 18 holes, and then maybe go do a, you know, a broadcast a game. That's what I thought my life was supposed to be about. Comes all crashing down, ends, career ends after four years. I find myself still living in Houston with April, two young kids, and I'm discouraged, I'm disillusioned, I'm hurting, I'm lost, I'm trying to figure out purpose, I'm trying to figure out how to deal with this sense of failure. And we would go to a church, Quail Valley Church in Missouri City, Texas. And I walked in and I met a guy the second week we were there named Clint Summers. And Clint came up to me. Clint was in his 50s. Clint was a successful businessman. He was a small group leader at the church. He came up to me and he introduced himself. He said, hey, we'd love to have you in April join our small group. And uh, we started going to Clint and Roseanne's small group. And uh, Clint and I began to meet one-on-one. -on -one. And for one of the first times in my life, I could actually be honest with someone. I remember him sitting in our living room, him and Roseanne and me and April, the kids were in bed, and Clint asked me, he said, Dave, how are you doing? I said, Clint, I'm, I'm struggling. Man, I'm lost, I'm, I'm depressed, I'm, I feel like I failed, da, 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 da. He looked at me and he said, he didn't judge me. He didn't, like, give me some hyper-faith thing. You know, man, you should just be happy you made it this far. He didn't invalidate what I was going through. I remember he looked at me and he says, he says, man, I'm so sorry that your dream died. Can, can we pray for you? I said, man, yeah. He didn't pray some crazy prayer. He didn't, you know... Like, yeah, this is all going to fix it. Da, 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 da. But I felt cared for. I felt encouraged. And it was in that church over the next two years of meeting regularly with, with Clint and going to small group that, that, that every, every week I was being encouraged Hey, good to see you. Hey, how you doing? How's it? How? Hey, man, you got a call on your life. Hey, hey, Dave, we see that. that I, it was a place of encouragement for me. And the church is called to be a place of encouragement because out there, it, dude, I'm not trying to say like, man, we all need to just come hunker in and, you know, build our our bomb shelters in the church and it's, you know, and just, let's just live here. Y2K, you know, let's go to HEB and get 6,000 things of water. And uh, that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, is that, dude, it is tough out there. Because it's real. And we all go through challenges and setbacks and discouragement. Man, the church is called to be a place of encouragement. Look at what it says in Scripture. It says in 1 Thessalonians 5.11, 
Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you were doing. Colossians 4, 8 says, I'm sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. Man, part of being in a local church, being planted and connected in a local church, is, is because every single one of us, we need encouragement. Second thing, we all need connection and community. We all need connection and community. When I was moving down here, I was doing a study on this whole thing about community. And I was amazed at some of the writing that, that I read. There was a, a doctor from Duke University who talked about the uh, isolation epidemic in our culture right now is, is bigger than it's ever been. She summed it up. She said, we've never had more access, yet felt more isolated. People, we feel isolated. And that was never God's intention. God's intention is that we would, we would find connection, that we would find real community. Tim Keller said it like this, and his book, Center Church, and Manny talked about it this morning, said the greatest apologetic we will ever have to the world is the way we actually love and care for one another. The greatest apologetic we can have for the world is, is how, how, how do we love and care for one another? That's what Jesus said in John 17. Like they'll know you by your love. Come on. Tim Keller went on to say that in this era that we live in, in this culture that we live in, that when people come into the church and they don't find anything different than what's in the world, they leave and they're disillusioned. So he said, how, how you deal with people and power and, and, and all these things in the church, if, it, if it's not different than what's in the world, they'll look at all our efforts of evangelism just to accrue more power. Oh, you guys are just trying to build your own little kingdom. You guys are just trying to build your own little deal. Okay, we get what you're doing. You want to kind of suck us into this. No, no, no. We should be marked by our love for one another. I love the scripture in Romans 12, 9. It says, love must be sincere. Love must be sincere. And when April and I were moving here, about a year before we moved, I went up to see my dad inducted into his high school sports hall of fame. And every single person that got up, there were 16 people because they only do the inductions every five years. There were 16 people get, getting inducted at that particular one. And every single one of them got up and talked about somebody who had made a difference in their life, somebody that had invested in them, somebody that had mentored them, somebody that had called greatness and destiny out of them. Every single one of them pointed to at least one or two people who, who was the critical person in their life. And then every single person talked about wanting to give back and do the same thing. But one individual stole the night. He was a guy that was about this high. 
And he got up and he was just bawling. He said, you guys don't understand. Like, dude, I was a 1.7 GPA kid. I was just, just going through high school. No goals, no aim, no direction. None of it, man, just, just floundering around. And he said, I was walking down the hall one day and the defensive line coach for the football team came up to me and he, he struck up a conversation with me and he said, he said, I see something in you. He says, why don't you come out for the football team? And I'll pour my life in to you. And I see you one day being captain of this team. And I see you one day becoming all city. And he said, that man changed my life. He says, I had no talent. I had literally, most players on that team had more talent in their thumb than I had, but I worked and he poured into me and he did all this. And he said, and I ended up being captain of the team and becoming all city honorable mention. And he said, I've lived the last 25 years of my life wanting to do the same thing for the east side of Toledo. And I was driving back, and I called April, and I said, hey, man, the banquet went great. My dad was on. It was awesome. Da, 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 da. I told her this story, and I said, I said, I, I want to love like that. I don't want to just go through the motions of life. I don't want to just go through the motions of church where I show up and I don't really give a crap about you. And it's all just about, you know, the show and let's get bigger and more money coming in and blah, 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 blah. I was like, April, I, I want to love like that. I want to care about a, a group of people like that. I want to love when it hurts. Because I don't want to just go through life and get to be 65 years old and look back and go, dude, it was really just all about me. And God's built the church to be a place of encouragement but to also be a place where you find real connection and real community and real love and real service and real faith can be lived out because it's easy to live it out when you don't have to actually do it with anyone. It's easy to do it there. It's hard to do it. That's why most people don't want to get involved with messy people because it's hard. But the church is called to get engaged in it. Man, a place of connection and community. A place of equipping and training. Like, I didn't know how to do life. It was men in the church that said, hey, follow me as I follow Christ. Here's how you be a husband. Here's how you be a father. Here's how, here's how, wife, here, wife, here's how you be a wife. Here's how you be a mother. It was the people of God in the church that actually began to equip me and train me for how, how to actually live and do life. We all need sanctification and growth. Challenged to grow. I can't tell you how many times I've needed correction and input in my life. The Bible says this, man, faithful are the wounds of a friend. I can't tell you how many times where I've done something and maybe treated April wrong and I have a brother there and he says, hey, bro, I saw, hey, you know what? Like, God's got something better for you. Like, you, you, that's attitude. It's so much easier to live it when there's no, again, when there's nobody around. 
The unexamined life is not worth living. We need sanctification and growth. We all need a purpose beyond ourselves. And in the church, you can find purpose. That's Look, I literally walked into the church just wanting to follow Jesus, authentically wanting to grow. And in the last 25 years, I've gotten to go to 50 countries. Because the churches that I've been a part of had a vision for the world. There was a purpose beyond myself. When I was in Indianapolis, I ran across the lady, Peggy O'Connor. She passed away about six months ago. Peggy came up to me and she began to tell me her story about addiction and recovery. She started Celebrate Recovery at our church at Traders Point. At one point in time, more people were getting baptized in and through Celebrate Recovery than any other ministry of the church. Because it was a safe place for people to come and get ministry and be real. And Peggy asked to meet with me one day. And I said, sure, let's, let's meet. I said, what's on your heart? She says, Dave, I have a heart for every women's penitentiary in greater Indianapolis. I want to start Bible studies in every single one of these because I have a heart for these ladies who are broken and feel like they're, they're beyond repair. I said, Peggy, how can I help you? She said, I don't know. Help, figure, I mean, help me figure out how to do this. And so we started In the last year I was at Traders Point, I went up into the block area where the high school students would meet. And on a table from here back to about where Lori Sattler is, seven or eight rows back, was just rows of paper. And she said, do you know what this is? I was like, no, what is it? She goes, Dave, these are all the ladies in all the prisons in Indianapolis who are in Bible studies. I wept. I looked at every name. And there were exes and those who would come to different Bible studies. And she said, Dave, literally 179 of these ladies have given their lives to Christ. Amen. Peggy found a purpose beyond her pain and beyond herself. She began to see that everything that she had, went, had gone through and that God had redeemed in and through her, that God was going to use that to make a difference in the world. She passed away, literally, about six or seven months ago. Hundreds and hundreds of lives have been impacted. And last, we all need for it to be not exclusively just about us. Because we can all get narcissistic, we can all get self-centered, and the church allows us to come in to a, to a community and to a situation where, guess what? We get to contribute. And that's the biggest thing in culture going on right now. Will you come to church to ultimately be a consumer or will you come to church to ultimately be a contributor. They lead radically different places. If you just come to consume, man, it's, it, it, it's empty. If you come to contribute, hey, what, what, can, what can I bring? 
What is it that God, how has God uniquely gifted me? And why? Like, I have something to bring and contribute to this body. I truly believe I cannot, I could not have become and not do and be everything Christ has called me to do and be without the church. And I truly believe that every single one of us sitting in here, we ultimately can't become everything God has called us to be apart from the church. This, this should be the place of encouragement. This should be the place of purpose. This should be the place of connection and community. This should be the place of healing. This should be the place that the world looks in. I'm telling you, that motivates me every day. I want to love people so that the world looks in and says, okay, that's different. That's different. Because everybody else is about themselves. I haven't seen something where it's not. And this is refreshing. That's why. That's what I believe. That's what I want this church to become and be about. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much just that you died for the church. God, you gave your life for it. The local church, God, is the place where, God, you've called us to be nurtured, to be cared for, to find connection, to find purpose, to find community. God, thank you for what you're doing here at Renovate. God, just uh, I pray that, that you would enlarge our vision. That this isn't just about a show on Sunday. <laughs> this isn't just about coming and singing a couple songs and hearing a guy talk. and No, 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 God, you, you're doing something so much bigger here in these relationships and families and all this. There's so much, something so much bigger happening. God, let us, let us get a glimpse of it and let us not just look at the local church and go, eh, <laughs> I'll tolerate the local church. Ah, the local church is unnecessary. Oh, the local church is boring. Oh, the, the, no, this is your bride. This is your people. This is your community. God, enlarge our vision for what you can do and be in and through us. We ask it in your name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm out of breath. Thank you so much for being here. If you need prayer at all for anything, we'll have some of our prayer team down here this morning. Um, we're glad. If you have any questions about Renovate, you can stop by Connection Central in the back. Uh, those of you who are going to be a part of Renovate Connect, uh, we'll be meeting over there in about 10 minutes, and uh, we'll get started. So love you guys. Love walking with you, doing life with you. And uh, look forward to seeing you next Sunday. Thanks. Yay! Last week of school. And I'll try to remember how to say idea next week. <laughs>